Okay, greetings. Back to the mud flood subject. I just solved a major mystery, and that is that if you remember in a lot of videos by folks um, with the mud flood subject where the buildings have very high ceilings and large open spaces in very cold environments, the question is, um, you know, how could they heat these buildings that is uh, something that would be prohibitively expensive with these fireplaces um, they're just too uh, in just inadequate as far as putting out enough heat to um, keep everybody warm in these huge skyscrapers and mansions and huge brick and stone buildings that cover tens of thousands of square feet in a single building and um, I think I have the answer and it's very um, very telling with the other things that people say about these buildings Tonight we will, this, the program is The Lost Art of Steam Heating, and I am so happy to see that, say that. And Dan Hollihan began his love affair with heating systems in 1970, going to work for a New York-based manufacturer's representative that was deeply involved in the steam and hot water heating business. He studied hard, prowled many basements and attics with seasoned old timers, and paid close attention to what they had to say. Today, Dan operates the popular website, heatinghelp.com. He has written hundreds of columns for Plumbing and Mechanical, PM Engineer, Supply House Times, Oil Heating, Fuel Oil News, Old House Journal, Contractor, and Canada's HPAC. He's written 15 books on subjects ranging from steam and hot water heating to teaching technicians. From Maine to Hawaii and Florida to Alaska, Dan has taught over 200,000 people at his seminars. Thank you. This is, this, is a, this is my bucket list place. I never in my life ever thought that I would get to be here and, and uh, look around, let alone speak to you people. This is just, this is the, it's the, it's the Mechanics Institute of Peace. You know, it's, it's just, this is, this, I'm so excited. With the buildings and the steam and the dead men, the, uh, the people that put this stuff in. And to me, it's all history and whimsy and, and just beauty. You know, the, uh, the, the, the beauty of the simple things, the, the Delacorte clock that sits there and is magical in whatever age and even more magical because it sits right next to this building, which has been there since before Central Park. Parks Department and they asked me if I would take a look at some of their buildings and I said which one they said the Arsenal and I said oh my god because the Arsenal was was there to store weapons for two years and then the city decided that they were going to put a park there so they uh, <clears throat> so they took the Arsenal and they turned it into a police precinct for just a little bit of time and then and then they turned it into <clears throat> the original Museum of Natural History while they were building the real one and then they turned it into a menagerie for P.T. Barnum's animals. And then they turned it into an art museum. And then they turned it into the Weather Bureau. And then they turned it into the headquarters for the Parks Department, where Robin Moses did so much of his work until they moved to the Tribor Bridge, Randall's Island. And, and the building is there, and, it, and it, it's running off of Con Ed steam on a special type of system that uh, there's only one of two systems that the Parks Department has that, that does run on Con Ed steam. And they bring in high pressure steam just as they do here, another iconic building. Well, look at this video. It starts off with the spinning globe, and you know what that means. It's going to have some bullshite in it. No matter where you live, there's no doubt that energy 
is one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. Scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs around the world are working on solutions to increase energy efficiency and slow the growth of greenhouse gases. At the same time, we must meet the increasing energy demands of a growing population. What if there were an energy technology that could increase energy security right now, not years from now? And provide high quality jobs today, not years from now? Well, there is such a technology, and it's already here. It's called district energy. District energy is all around us, operating in cities from New York to Paris, from Dubai to Copenhagen. Landmark buildings like the U.S. Capitol, the Kremlin, and the Louvre get their heating or cooling from a district energy system. Around the globe, most major cities and college campuses are served by district energy. Even world-famous medical centers such as the Mayo Clinic and the Texas Medical Center depend on district energy. Why? Because of its compelling economics and outstanding reliability. Available round the clock from qualified energy professionals. Maybe you haven't heard much about district energy. That's because it's been quietly doing its job, keeping people comfortable and conserving energy for decades in some places for more than a century. But it's time to let the secret out. District energy is all around us. It's right under your feet. Here's how it works. Heating and cooling are provided to multiple buildings from a central energy plant. Steam, hot water, or chilled water from the plant is transmitted 24-7 via underground pipes to customer buildings. The heating and cooling energy is transferred to the building's heating and air conditioning system, keeping everyone comfortable day and night. Buildings and communities with a district energy system don't need to own or operate their own boilers, chillers, and cooling towers. They can choose to connect to the district energy network. District energy aggregates the heating and cooling needs of dozens or even hundreds of buildings, creating tremendous economies of scale and efficiency. An economy of scale creates opportunities. Opportunities to run central plants at optimal efficiency rather than many individual systems at part load. Opportunities for combined heat and power where the useful energy is more fully utilized. And opportunities where the community scale makes it feasible to use even lower carbon energy sources like surplus heat, biomass, lake or ocean water, or geothermal energy. For example, district energy plants can run on multiple fuels. This gives them the flexibility to switch to less expensive fuels as market conditions change. That's not a practical option for most individual buildings. In many cases, a district energy system can incorporate highly efficient combined heat and power technology. This can significantly increase the efficiency of a power plant. Simply put, combined heat and power captures the waste heat created when making electricity and puts it to use to heat buildings or drive chillers. New York City figured this out more than 100 years ago. Consolidated Edison of New York operates one of the world's largest district energy systems, serving around 1,800 buildings in Manhattan. More than 50% of its steam is produced by cogeneration units, which are a highly efficient form of combined heat and power technology. Now that just doesn't make sense. Um, if you're creating heat to generate electricity, then you create the heat and you use the heat to drive the, tur the steam turbine. And once the steam has driven the turbine, the energy is spent and it's about to condense. It's barely even steam if you're doing it efficiently. You're not gonna have enough left over to heat an entire city by blasting steam, especially then to drive cooling units. It does not make sense. It only makes sense if the steam source is a nearly endless um, stream coming out from the earth, which we know you can do. You drill down enough and all you have to do is run a loop down there, put water in, you're going to get steam out the other end. You're going to have the weight of the water going into the one pipe. Uh, all you have to do is have a, a perforated pipe going down that takes the groundwater down and uh, have a larger pipe coming up 
that is going to blast um, steam up and then they just route it around. I think that's what they're doing and that's the big secret. Um, the other possibility is just running these um, high efficiency resonant frequency uh, turbines to generate electricity as well, which they may do as backup, but uh, I think it's geothermal. I think that's one of the big secrets here and if you know I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing and they probably keep it secret because people wouldn't understand paying for it probably it wasn't paid for in the past much you know if the government runs it you know that would be the proper way to do it where they don't uh, charge much for it although with the district idea it's a lot of dependence on that and there's got to be an option for independence that remains in case you don't like the person running it who may make your building too cold or too hot, whatever. Customers use the steam for space heating, domestic hot water production, and air conditioning. In fact, New York City avoids about 350 megawatts of electricity on its power grid because customers use steam-driven chillers for air conditioning. District Energy St. Paul operates a combined heat and power facility. The district heating and cooling systems serve most of the downtown buildings, and 25 megawatts of electricity is supplied to the local grid. Around the world, you'll find district energy systems at the center of innovation. Solar district heating in Denmark and Sweden, deep lake water district cooling in Toronto, combined heat and power fueled by oat hulls at the University of Iowa, geothermal-based district heating in Turkey, combined heat and power fueled by landfill gas at UCLA. The list goes on. These are all different solutions, but none of them would be feasible without a district energy system. Just think about the thousands of district energy systems that are already saving energy and helping the environment. What if even more district energy systems could be constructed? We could help existing district energy systems expand and stronger and smarter. What if we could use district energy infrastructure to utilize local energy resources. We can do all of this and more. District energy is the foundation for a smart, sustainable energy future. Let's take control of that future by investing in district energy. Tomorrow's energy, today. And here we got the arsenal running on eight pounds of pressure. So we go in and we start being nosy, and we always begin at where the steam comes into the building, and, and there's this pressure reducing valve, and, and the building is two pipe steam, and they had put thermostatic radiator valves, the non-electric type, on every radiator. Steam traps, trap steam. If, if you're new to this and you want to know what the thing does, just turn the name around, it tells you what it does. Steam traps, air vents, condensate pumps, even in plumbing, P-traps, they do. They do. So it's just, it just turned the name around and, and you got it. So climbing up into drop ceilings and looking with, a, with an open mind and a bright flashlight. At one point we went into the boardroom and there on the, on the wall, almost the length of that bookshelf, is, is the original drawing of what Central Park will be by Frederick Law Olmsted. And I walked over and hugged it. You would have done that too. And that's the best thing about being a heating guy because we get to go places that most people don't get to go. Like here. Huh? So because it's the weight of the water trying to fall out versus the atmospheric pressure holding it in. So it's these, it's these forces of, <clears throat> of nature. Water flows downhill, heat goes toward cold. Heat doesn't rise, hot air rises, hot water rises. All these things that you know instinctively. You know everything you need to know. You just don't know that you know it. So why not, why not water seals instead of steam traps? They worked in, they worked in 1890 and, and, and they're still working. If you go down to lower Manhattan, those systems are still in place because there's no moving parts to them except the water. And I turn and I see across the park, there was the, uh, the Dakota, which is a really important building to me because that was, that was built in uh, 1884. And it was called the Dakota because the architects made fun of it. It was an apartment building built on the other side of Central Park where we've got houses over here that I showed you earlier, mansions. And in 1884, it was, it was absurd that anybody would live in an apartment building with other people. Who's gonna do that? You know, nobody will ever do that. And look what they built it for Pete's sakes. There's nothing up there. They might as well have built it in Dakota. 
So they decided to call it the Dakota. And who decided to call it the Dakota was uh, were the builders, uh, Edward Clark and, and Isaac Merritt Singer. So here we've got when it first opens up. And I, I love this picture. Because on that day, they, they were just filled with joy and it was going to be a fabulous time and, and, and life was going to be good for them. They had no idea that someday there was going to be a thing called rock and roll. They didn't know there was going to be a band called the Beatles that would come and play in 1965 at Chase Stadium. They didn't know that these little saplings over here would someday grow tall and be called Strawberry Fields. They didn't know any of that. But on the day that that system is running, that heating system, that's the same heating system that's running right now. It's a landmark building. They don't get to change that. So that's, that's the amazing part about New York is that you can have a building like that filled with people that are so rich, it's scary, and they have to work with a heating system from 1884. These are the guys that built it. So Edward Clark finishes it. This is his partner. They were partners in the Singer Sewing Machine family. They were, uh, they were uh, not good friends. They, uh, uh, Isaac Singer was a, was a philanderer. He, uh, he had five families all at the same time here in New York and countless children that he didn't know. And when he died, all of that came out. And his, uh, his widow, there was, a, there was a famous battle. This is the stuff you find out when you're looking at old radiators. But his widow was uh, Isabella Boyer Singer. And she was a... Uh, considered to be one of the most beautiful women in the world at the time. Uh, standards have somewhat changed, I think. But, uh, but back, back in the day, she, she was a serious hottie. So, uh, so she, uh, she, she leaves with the Singer sewing machine fortune and, and moves back to, uh, to France, because she's, she's from France. And this is the best part of the story, because when she moves back to France, she's quite famous there. So famous, in fact, that Bartholdi decides to use her for the, for the uh, uh, model of the Statue of Liberty. So when you look at the Statue of Liberty's face, that is Isabella Boyer Singer. And this is the stuff that you can find out by poking around old buildings. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know about these mud flooders. And I know because I've lived in these, too. Um, in fact, I think, I think I may even be living in one right now. <laughs> because... Um, where where I live, I had to insulate, and I was just amazed. It, it, I live in a red brick home, and it had no insulation, and um, it was very hard to heat. And so I got it sealed up and insulated. And um, so, what I've found is this concept and a lot of evidence that all these buildings were heated via district heating which is steam heating and it's an ingenious concept and it's installed in these older buildings all around the world um, Paris, New York, Chicago, Toronto it's always been there but they the, the knowledge of how it works and the knowledge of how it's used has nearly been lost, but they're rediscovering it starting in about um, the 1960s to the 1990s. They started to reutilize these systems that were already in place. And the way it works is they just pump water using steam um, and it's geothermal. It goes down into the ground and... Uh, Ostensibly, they're saying now that it goes to a plant where they burn garbage and such, and it forces the steam, the the decompression of water into steam. Well, compression, the expansion of water into steam is a factor of 1,700. So if you have a, a bottle of water and you turn it into steam, it would fill 1,700 bottles of um, steam from one bottle of water. So that works as the pump. And it um, pumps the steam, and then the steam goes into the radiant heaters and to whatever buildings connect up to the pipes. It's all underground. And um, the thing about the building or the home is that it needs to have uh, leakiness. In other words, it needs to not be insulated. It needs to have gaps all over the place. And it has a slight pressure. And 
um, it may have a cold air return that goes into a sub basement tunnel. So that explains, I think, a lot of the tunnels that you see everywhere. And um, the thing about it is, I don't know if the source of the steam has ever been ascertained. Um, well, ever, I'm sure it has been ascertained and it is likely geothermal. It just would make sense if you go deep enough, you'll get to the point where it's turning it into steam and then it just runs automatically and uses no electricity. But I think they're keeping that a secret. I think that they're creating these things in order to um, charge customers. So, um, But these mud flood buildings, there's one on Fifth Avenue that this guy talks about that is a um, HVAC specialist and he talks about going into this $40 million mansion. And uh, I'd like to know, you know, if the source that is the original source, which would be geothermal. And that's something that's been known for a long time, but I think the extent of it was understated by a lot. And a lot of people didn't realize that they already even had that in place, like the um, building owner of the fifth, Avenue Mansion that is featured uh, in this video. So, uh, so along Fifth Avenue, when the people like, uh, you know, when when the when the people that could afford it built these mansions along there, Con Ed, well, prior to Con Ed, New York Steam Company actually set up a, a boiler plant just for them. So they had their own boiler plant. The arsenal is tapped into that same line to this day. And um, in 1888, when that major blizzard came through, they were the only people in the city that continued to have heat. So that made district heating very popular and that's part of what makes this building uh, uh, you know what you see now that this is on district heating because Con Ed you know they said this is one of the pluses you don't have to depend on people trying to deliver fuel to you if everything's coming to you underground 973 Fifth Avenue is, is a, a, a house that I looked at a couple of years ago and, and it was a fascinating place because it had just sold I think for 40 million dollars and there were two people and a kid moving into it and and they were going to, uh, they were going to uh, put in, you know, new HVAC split system. But they they wanted to know if it was viable to keep the Con Ed steam. So I went there to look at it, mostly because I'm nosy, and uh, you know, look at it. So I, I went in there and I, I'm wandering around, and uh, what they had there was indirect heating. So this is this is from a time when they would bring in 100% fresh air from the outside and it would waft over what are essentially boiler sections that hang suspended in ductwork and then come up through the uh, floor grates that were placed all over the place. So inside you've got this type of a setup in, inside the ductwork and it's coming up through grates in the floor that look very decorative like that or, or in the walls. And in most of these older buildings they had, they had uh, no return air uh, duct going back. It was the leakage of the building that made it work. So, so they'd bring in cold air from outside, heat it up, send it up into the building, and then it would just leak out. And the comedy of that is, is when you get a super rich person that decides to uh, bring in a blower door test and, and button up the house and weatherize it and make it real tight, now suddenly he has no heat at all. I love that. That's when you could charge a fortune to, to uh, you know, punch holes in his walls. And so, so, but these people on Fifth Avenue, they actually had a return air duct, and it was the most fascinating one I've ever seen in my life because it was that stairway. So this went up seven stories inside the house. And the heat is coming up out of the ground uh, on each floor through those beautiful grates, the bronze grates. And the air would very gently just fall back down the center of that stairway. And at the bottom of that stairway, there was this door that was very decorative. And when you opened the door, there was nothing in there except a big return air duct that went right back down to the basement, all working off Con Ed. So the thing is, if you know what it is that you're looking at, you could become a very valuable person, right? And if I could do this, anybody could do this. Believe me. Well, that you know it. Sometimes you just need somebody to remind you, or sometimes you just have to stop back up and remind yourself, right? We go on these old jobs and we see these gauges that measure both pressure and vacuum. It goes from zero to 15 pounds of pressure because that's the limit of a low pressure steam boiler. And then it goes down to 30 inches of vacuum. And that's because when they were burning coal before we had oil and before we had gas, they had a problem <clears throat> toward the end of the day the coal pile would burn down. 
So that was the problem that the old timers, the dead men had with these systems that where the coal pile would burn down. So, so they came up with this method of driving the system into a vacuum per liter. But if you overboil to get there, you're going to leach your tannins. Bitterness. Yuck. Let's make a little bit of pressure, less than a pound of pressure, and we'll push the air out of the system. And on every air vent, there will be a check valve built into the air vent. So the air will go out, and when the steam condenses and shrinks to 1 1,700th its volume, the air won't be able to get back in. So I pull a mild vacuum. So the system then will go into a deep vacuum, and you'll be able now to boil water at temperatures below atmospheric pressure. And that way I can keep the temperature no higher than 92 C. So you, you'd be sending steam up into the building at temperatures, in some cases, as low as 150 degrees steam going up into the building. And that was, that was a pretty sweet way of heating. So that was called vapor vacuum heating. And that was what was once in this building in a, in a different version. Why the hell are we making meth? The vacuum system, where they use a big pump to produce vacuum, that, that comes up years later. And this, this gives the people that are building the building the advantage of downsizing every pipe valve and fitting in the building by at least one size. Empire State Building is a vacuum system. So if you want to save money on the go in, you size it for a vacuum pump that's going to pull the air out of the system and create a a negative pressure on the return side so that the condensate comes back faster and the air comes out of the system faster. The problem is it depends on the steam traps on the radiators and at the ends of the mains to be working because if steam traps don't trap steam, that really, really hot stuff comes back into the vacuum pump, which is in a vacuum, and it blows up the motor. So steam traps, when they fail on the radiators, they typically fail in the open position because that's the position that will cause you the most grief. <laughs> And when it does that, the steam creeps into the returns and makes the condensate hotter and hotter and hotter. And this is never reported. It's not like it's in the, it's, it, it's not in the, in the daily news. It's not in an obituary. Uh, the, the trap doesn't clutch its chest and scream and fall down. You don't notice it. It just fails. And so somebody comes along and says, why don't we just put one big trap right here at the end of the main, right before the pump? Seems like a great idea, right? We can, it's like put the trap at the trunk of the tree to protect the pump. And when I see that, I always ask what I call the dead men question, which is, if that could be done, don't you think they would have done it? Were these people so stupid that they put traps on all the radiators because they had extra traps and time on their hands? No, they're out there for a reason. They're like the balancing valves in a hot water heating system. Those are, that's what steam traps do. They, they create points of pressure and no pressure. So. Once we put this big trap right here, the vacuum pump now pulls a vacuum from here to that trap, which then opens and vomits super hot water into the pump and blows it up all over again. Plus, you're now double trapping the line here, because if any traps in the building are still working, you just created what they had at the arsenal. So the water backs up in the line, you get water hammer, you get uneven heating, you get no heat, and you get some knucklehead raising the pressure. You don't even have to be that good to get this stuff right. All you have to do is Think about basic things and maybe read a little. In New York City. Now, this is an older video, and I happened to be looking at properties in New York City. Not that I could <laughs> afford it, but just for fun, I was looking. Uh, when I first got on Zillow a long time ago, I was just having fun looking for, like, the most expensive buildings. And I think I actually looked at this because I went to Fifth Avenue knowing that's one of the most expensive places and I didn't find any homes, which kind of surprised me at the time. And then I found this one home and it's this mansion and he mentioned it sold for $40 million. And I remember that number. It's kind of esoteric, trivial knowledge that I memorize, like photographic memory almost. And it was indeed a um, super mansion and it was, I think, it was the last home on the island of Manhattan. And I remember a few years after that seeing a, an article saying that the last home on Manhattan is being demolished. And I, I was flabbergasted because, I, number one, Manhattan's a huge island. And uh, number two don't they have a sense of history wouldn't they preserve especially the very last home it's ridiculous but um, I'm sure by now it's demolished 
Um, I'm, I'm almost certain that it is. I think I read that. And uh, the thing is, this HVAC guy went into the home the last time it sold to a family, or I don't know if it's a family. He said two people and a child. So it's kind of a strange thing to say of who bought it. But anyway, that's neither here nor there and not the point at all. The point is that they called him in there to this seven-story mansion uh, to ascertain what the heating is. And he took a look at it, and he saw one of the most wondrous functional heating systems ever. And it was steam heat that came, he said, from a line of Con Edison. <laughs> so Edison, who's a you know, a prick con man, con Edison, I just thought it was funny, um, but uh, con Edison, yeah, so if you want to believe where the steam comes from, that I'm sure they have a plant and charge money for it, but it came whether you paid for it or not, <laughs> and uh, the steam came in it's piped through the building. It can heat the entire building, no problem. It runs day, night, all the time, 24-7, never stops. And uh, so take a listen to these clips and let me know what you think. I have quite a bit of evidence, and this is only basically the tip of the iceberg. If you are wondering what this is, this is an image of the same kind of district heating coils that was discovered um, in, by the Wise Up channel, and he was looking at it saying it's some sort of refrigeration type thing. Didn't know what it was, and I think that I'm certain, well, I'm almost certain that it is an ancient antediluvian, so pre Noah's flood district heating underground heat exchange loop where something like glycol or something akin to R134A or 1234YF or some refrigerant could be carbon dioxide, it could be um, just water steam, uh, but something with a high expansion value that changes from the liquid to gas phase was used and it was buried in the great flood the deluge of Noah's time and it was um, it's a it's either a casting or it's a petrification I don't think it's a vitrification although parts of it may be vitrified and there are distinct differences but I won't get into those in this video I just wanted to show this to you because I'm starting to piece these things together and it is relevant to today because they are forcing building owners to sign up to district heating in cities like Chicago and uh, New York and all over the place, Toronto. Um, and these companies are reusing the tunnels, all the pipes and, and things that basically are already there. They just have to update them. You know what I did? You know how I learned this? I went to the library on 42nd Street. There's a big library there. They got a lot of books in there. So you just got to read a little bit every day. Up in the servants' quarters in that, in that house, they had these. So we've got thermostatic radiator valves that are just laying on the floor, and we've got steam traps over here. So that's where it's not fancy in that part of the building. And then we went up on the roof. And... Uh, because I wanted to know, you know, I wanted to know if this building had ever had a boiler in it, and we went up in the roof looking for a chimney, and there, there wasn't, so I'm looking over there, and I, this is the stuff that you can find out by poking around old buildings, because the Dakota had this, it also had big funnels on the roof, as wide as this table, and they collected rainwater and ran the elevators off the rainwater that they collected. They also produced steam with a steam engine, and they passed it to the buildings around them. So when other buildings were built, there were tunnels that still are there under the street, uh, under 72nd Street to go to these other buildings because they were selling power and steam. So this is one of the first cogen plants in the world, the Dakota. Imagine this. 
The time goes by, these are the radiators that they have there. They're, they're uh, radiators that were made from surplus gun barrels left over after the Civil War. They're called reed radiators. And each one of those old gun barrels is, is plugged at the top and there's a tube that runs up the inside. And over here you can see the remnants of, of what was called a, uh, a Paul system after Andrew Paul. This building has that same system. So in the, the Dakota also employs uh, three guys that sit in the basement all day long waiting for somebody to call, up, call down and say, it's a little chilly up here, can you come up? And they go up and they open those valves and then they go down and wait. <laughs> and then they say, now it's a little hot, can you come up? And, and they go up and they close those valves. These are two-legged zone valves. Nice, up and down all day long. It's good, it's good stuff. So there it is in 2005 when, when the gates were up and, uh, and today in 2015, 10 years later, it's still operating off the same steam system that was there when it was first built in 1884. If you know how that system works, you become a very, very valuable person. 85 Fifth Avenue has the same system and it has, it has two pipe steam up to that point and then one pipe steam above that to the stories that they added. And it's very common to have steam that's two pipe and one pipe in the same building. And this was a, a building that was part of the Ladies' Mile back in the day. They, this area down in Fifth Avenue, down in the teens, was, uh, was the place where the women went to shop and all these buildings were stores. And when you go into it now, you've got the same two-pipe air vent system. So it's a, a supply going up, a return going down, and the radiators are connected like the rungs on a ladder. And the steam favors the supply line because the pressure is a little bit lower there. But it moves through the radiators and into the return and then up toward the air vents. So the steam is rising up both lines toward the air vents. And that's normal. So this is the simplest of all systems. Why would anybody mess with that? That's what you have here. You don't want to start Bringing, it's like trying to put rollerblades on an elephant for peace sakes. You don't want to modernize something that's that significantly simple. You know, just leave it as it is. So that's, that's water hammer. That's what you get when you got steam moving at gale force wind across the surface of the water and it picks it up and the water can't get out of the way so it gets picked up and it gets thrown toward the end and it's going to hit with tremendous violence. So much so that uh, when Con Ed has that experience as they did here in 2007, this was caused by... Uh, a contractor that was working with, uh, within the system while it was under pressure sealing something and the sealant got loose and it went into two steam traps and it caused this explosion that killed one person and put stuff on the top of the Chrysler building. So that's the tremendous potential for water hammer. All caused because that morning there was a super big rain and when this thing happened I said to my wife the rain did that because the rain goes down into those holes and it gets on the outside of the pipe. When you see those cones on those corners where you see the steam coming out, that's not a steam leak. That's, that's rainwater on the outside of the pipes. That's what you're seeing coming out of those tubes with Con Ed. So this cost them, by the time it was settled, I think it was, I think it was $40 million for two steam traps. So a lot to be said for preventative maintenance, right? Followed up by lawsuits. So water hammer will do that. Uh, here's a radiator that was hammering like crazy. So you gotta ask the question, will water flow uphill on a one pipe steam radiator? If we're gonna pipe it like that, well, can water drain out of that radiator? Here's one in Brooklyn where they had such severe water hammer that the contractor decided to screw a hot water heating system extra expansion tank into the steam line to act as some sort of a shock absorber. Didn't work, but it was a great try. Wasn't that fabulous? Uh, so here, here's another one. We got this convector that's coming up and it's going into a uh, steam pipes come out of the floor, it goes over here, there's the air vent, and it comes back over here, there's a check valve, and it goes right back into the same pipe. What do you think of that? <laughs> now you're laughing, but this is actually brilliant. We tap off the vertical riser, and we go into the radiator, and we pitch in the direction of flow, and we come back, and we give ourselves just a little bit of height here, and a check valve, and we go right back into the same riser. So the steam goes this way, the steam keeps the check valve closed, Steam pushes through the air vent, toward the air vent. There's always going to be some leftover pressure on this side that combines with the weight of the water in this vertical pipe to open the check valve and the condensate slides right back down the main. That's what they're doing here. See that? So it comes up here, pitches this way, comes down the height of the water here, combines with the steam pressure that's there to open that check valve to send it right down. So, still laughing? What did you just learn? All right. When you see something that's old and it's been there for a long time and it's working, don't laugh at it. Marvel at it. I laughed at it. 
Madonna lives in, lived in this building. She had a, she had a system that was done by a, a man named John Mills, and this was, uh, John Mills was, was dead, you know, in the 19th century, but, uh, but John Mills uh, gave us a lot of things, and, and one of them was the Mills system, and Madonna's building had, had screwed pipes. So there were air vents at the top and air vents on the radiators, and I was up here in a crawl space with a friend, and this was a 12 by 12 by 3 quarter inch screwed T. Now, that is, that's probably a 300 pound fitting, you know, it's, 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 bigger than, it's bigger than your imagination, but when you see something like that, it, it's marvelous to think like, who did this? Like, who put this here? You know, who, who, who were these guys that were able to do this sort of work? So when we look at something like that, we have to consider all the ways water's getting back into the boiler. In a gravity return system such as we have here, we've got, we've got say, uh, uh, well, out here, the distance between the lowest horizontal steam pipe and the boiler water line has to be at least 28 inches, which is equal to a pound of water weight. And that's because if we start out with, say, two pounds of pressure in the boiler, we're going to lose energy as we go around, so we might only have, say, one and a half pounds of pressure left over in a really big building. So on one side of the scale, we've got two pounds, and on the other side of the scale, we've got one and a half pounds, so the water's going to back out of the boiler and go up this line. So we allow a space at 28 inches, so that, that equals a pound. So a pound and a half of leftover steam combines with a pound of water weight to put the water back in the boiler. It's called gravity return. This gets gloriously screwed up on jobs as soon as they add motorized valves. See, because you put a motorized valve in there, the motorized valves start to close. Now we need a condensate pump, because otherwise everything's going to back out of the boiler when the, con when the motorized valves close. And as soon as you put a condensate pump in here, when the motorized valves close, you get a deep vacuum in this piping above the boiler water line and this piping here. And you stand there and you watch the water in the gauge glass just zoom right up as the vacuum forms, because the atmospheric pressure here just pushes the water out of the pump and into the boiler. And again, it's all basic stuff that you knew when you were growing up and sticking straws in a bottle of milk. 1918, we had an event called the Spanish Influenza that changed heating once and for all. Because the Board of Health came out and it said, now we have to, we have, to have our windows open. So 19, 19, 19, 20, I start to see books that talk about open, the, the fresh air movement, the heating engineering books said we have to design for the coldest day of the year with the wind blowing and the windows open. Right? So that changes everything. So we, 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 we have this, this movement that just takes the world by storm. Here's, you know, because in, it, Spanish influenza killed 50 million people, which is, which is equal to the entire population of the northeast portion of the United States of America. 50 million people died from this thing. You've probably never even heard of it. It was the worst disaster in the history of the world. Here's a guy that got shot by a cop because he refused to put on his influenza mask when he was outside. You weren't allowed out on the street without that mask. Guy, cop shoots him. That's how serious this stuff was. 40,000 people in Manhattan died from this thing in that one winter. So then the depression arrives, and, and, and now we're sizing heating systems for open window ventilation. The depression shows up, and, and people are, you know, they've got these these oversized radiators that they're paying to, you know, paying for coal, and, and they say, you know, shut the, shut the window. What are you doing? So people start shutting the windows, and now these radiators are putting out more heat than Shakira. You know, the, you're in there, and you can't, you can't even breathe. So they said, do something. So, so, the, so they start to do stuff like this. They, they make these embroidered slide over the, the radiator to pull up and down to, uh, to stop the heat from coming off. And then they said to the government, do something. So the government steps in and they discover that, that if you use this, this special kind of paint called bronzing, it has this effect of, of cutting the radiator's output by 20%. And it's, it's, it, it's a particular paint that contains metal flakes. And they published this. So they said, here, if we have a radiator that's cast iron and not painted, it's 100% effective. It's putting out 240 BTUs per square foot. And if we paint it aluminum bronze, it cuts it down to 192. In other words, it takes 20% off. This is why radiators are silver. Next time you're out with somebody and you're looking at radiators, you're going around doing a survey, you tell them that story, you claim it as your own, they're going to think you're fascinating. Because don't you think I'm fascinating? <laughs> huh? If I could tell you something you didn't know, that's fascinating, right? Oh, by the way, look, if you, you, and it's only the final coat, because if you, if you go back and you paint it black, it goes back to 100%. Or if you paint it uh, the color of a flower pot, terracotta, you actually pick up 3.8%. So color does matter. And if, if you go on our website, I left a card there, and you look in the, just, just search, does the color of a radiator matter? You're going you're gonna to find the uh, National Bureau of Standards report from 1935 that explains the science behind all this. They also then decided they're going to put covers on the radiator, and it wasn't to keep the children from being burned. 
It was, it was to cut down on the heat. If you put something as simple as a shelf of, over the top of this, it, this says you have to add 20% to the size of the radiator to get the same output that you would get if the shelf were not there. This is the one that I love because you've got some of these upstairs. This is the, that classic radiator cover that's got the hinge top and it's got that perforated front. And you see it advertised and they'll say, you know, saves energy and all this. It does not save energy. It cuts 30% of the output. So it saves energy if the radiator is oversized by a lot because of open window ventilation. But that's, you see, it's, it's the history, uh, the sociology, the, the American history. All this stuff comes into play in the engineering that we're doing. You gotta know these stories. When there's 215 degree steam on the inside. Now why that's so important is because 215 degree steam happens to be steam at one PSI pressure. So on the coldest day of the year with the windows open, we're expecting it to be no more ever, no more than one pound of pressure inside that radiator. This is how the Empire State Building works on one and a half pounds. Now, this was determined at the, at the old Murray Hill Hotel right down the street at a meeting held by a group called the Carbon Club. Now the Carbon Club was primarily the American Radiator Company that put together a group of people and, the, and the, their purpose was to fix prices. And they were doing this when the Sherman Antitrust Act was already in, in effect for 10 years. So they were in tremendous violation of federal law. They didn't care. They were building an industry. So their purpose was to fix prices. And if a boiler company didn't join the Carbon Club, they were then ostracized, not only ostracized, but, but the members of the Carbon Club would find their customers and give them boilers for free. If you want to see the remnants of the American Radiator Company, go over to the Bryant Park Hotel, which is right around the corner here on 40th Street. It used to be the American Radiator Building. And it's, it's made of black stone to look like coal. And if you look up, you'll see that gold leaf crenellated roof that's supposed to look like the glowing embers in a coal boiler. The lobby in the restaurant of the Bryant Park Hotel used to be a showroom for boilers and radiators. Can you imagine there was a time in America when you can display a boiler in that address? This is how important this was. So they got together, the Carbon Club, and they were trying to find a way to make the systems safer so that there weren't as many explosions as there were at that time. So on December 18th, they had a meeting, and they, they said, okay, today we're going to make a decision. We're going to say that, that uh, from now on, every hot water system should operate on no more than 180 degrees. They just arbitrarily chose that. And then on December 19th, just before the end of the century, they said, from this day forward, we are going to establish what's called the two PSI standard. Any building built from this day forward will work on two pounds of pressure or less. And if it doesn't, it's the contractor's fault, because we're going to give you pipe sizing charts that measure the pressure drop of steam as it travels through the pipe at one ounce of loss for every hundred feet of travel. So if we start out with two pounds of pressure, 1,600 feet down the line, or 160 stories straight up in the air, we're still going to have one pound of pressure which will satisfy EDR. Get it? This is how the Empire State Building runs on that. So if you can't heat a building on two pounds of pressure or less, your problem is not the pressure, your problem is air. So you got to once again go back to wherever the boiler is, wherever the pressure reducing valve is, like in this building, and you ask this key question, if I were air, could I get out? And if you can't get out, the steam's not going to get in. Plus you get to be nosy and you get to wander around, it's, and that's the best part of all this, don't you think? Absolutely. Prior to World War II, what, why does steam boilers fade away? Uh, Prior to World War II, 50% of all the buildings in America by the U.S. Census were heated hydronically. Hy hydronic is anything that uses water, so it's, it includes steam and hot water. So before World War II, uh, it's, all, it's all steam and water except for uh, uh, the buildings that don't have central heat. So like my parents grew up in Manhattan. They didn't have heat until they were married. They had a stove, and, and, you know, living, in the, living in the, on the Upper East Side. So, so we've either got fireplaces or stoves, and... Most of, the, most of the country is heating hydronically. World War II happens, and during World War II, there is no heating industry. Everybody in the heating industry went into the production of something for the war, so you couldn't get any metal to make anything for the heating industry. We come out of the heating industry, and we're now in the 1950s, and in 1956, the Interstate Highway Act appears, thanks to President Eisenhower, and we suddenly begin to build roads out of our cities for the purpose of getting us away from nuclear war. But with this comes the suburbs. And a furnace will always be cheaper than a boiler. So it, it immediately shifts after World War II with the building of tract housing. And, and then comes air conditioning, which, which uh, you know, goes hand in hand with a furnace. 
even though the, for half the year your ducks are in the wrong place because hot air rises and cold air sinks. So now we've got to put in powerful fans that are going to make people uncomfortable, but people at this point don't even realize that they were uncomfortable because this is their first heating system. It's kind of like having a wedgie. You know, if you've got it every, t every day because your underwear is too tight, you don't even realize it after a while until somebody comes along and pulls that out and say, here, isn't that better? Right? So, so that's the reason why. So when I came into this industry, hydronics was about 11% of the business, and that was 45 years ago, and it continues to be 11% of the business. So it's a very profitable non-growth business. I think, it's, I think it's the laying on of too many hands that, that don't know what they're doing. Like everybody's trying something and touching it, and that changes it even further. When, when I, a few weeks ago, I spoke to the uh, Association of en Energy Engineers, and, and the, one of the fellows that was there, was involved in the, in the uh, redoing of the Empire State Building, which is now LEED Gold. Wow. So, so the Empire State Building has, has a, a steam system. And he said to me, so many people had touched that, and he says, you know what we did? We, we, he says, I've, I felt really good about this, because he says, we went back to your book, which is called The Lost Art of Steam Heating, and he says, let's put it back to the way it was in 1929. And he said, there's, there's a space above the highest point where the tourists can go, you know, not the main area, but you're right, another elevator. There's, he says there's a room up there, and the uh, public doesn't get to go up there. He says there's a radiator in that room. He says, I stood in that radiator and called downstairs and told him to open the steam valve, and he says the steam was at that radiator in seconds. He says, you are so right. It moves at the speed of sound. The only thing in its way is air. So, so if you bring things back to the way they were, you know, this, this, is, this is what we're trying to do here. Like, why do we have, why do we have a boiler feed pump dumping uh, water into a sewer when we could do that by gravity? There's a, there's a way, uh, it's called a false water line. This building used to have a boiler. And all the pipes that are in the basement used to be underwater. Suddenly you've got Con Ed steam and now you've got to put traps on those lines. Well, why not build a false water line, which is just a, it's, a, it's an old piping trick. We take a, we take a big wide piece of pipe, we, we put steam into the top, we put water into the bottom, we pipe some steam traps into the side of this bottle, and we set it so that the water line inside the bottle is about this high, and that puts everything in this building back under water. As, in other words, we match the bottle where, with wherever the water line of the boiler used to be. So no need for traps anymore down in the basement. And, and then you just spill out of the bottle and you go into a reservoir and the, res and the water will cool naturally in the reservoir and then, and then just flow by gravity. This is Alex's idea, right? And just flow into the sewer. So why not, why not water seals instead of steam traps? They worked in, they worked in 1890 and, and, and they're still working. If you go down to lower Manhattan, those systems are still in place because there's no moving parts to them except the water. Well, we really need to talk because I'm the chair of facilities for this building, so we'll talk offline. Um, and you, you mentioned Con Edison, and the very little that I know about steam these days is that it is a byproduct of creating electricity. So my question, and perhaps it is a sociological one, is if it's a byproduct, why is Con Ed charging us? Well, they st the they still have to move it to from so from the there. They have to get it from right, there the to, to here. I yeah, and that's there's a lot of there's a lot of, of science involved in that. A lot of is there really? Yeah, there really is. But you know, when I met Victoria, when I came here a couple of weeks ago, I walked in here. We started to look around, and I said to her, "You know what? I have lived my whole life and studied to come to this building." Well, thank you. Right. And I mean that. This is. Thank you. And, and I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, I. Watch I, what you I, say I, because we well, won't I, leave you alone. Well, I felt the same way when I walked into the Dakota. I felt the same way when I walked into the Empire State. But, you know, this is, these are iconic buildings. I'm a New Yorker. So what I need, what I need everybody to understand is something like the Arsenal. I touched that building with my mind. And in touching that building and giving what I studied to these people to make it work. I touched not only that building, but everybody that was involved in that building from 1840, and everybody that will be involved in that building when I'm dead. I had a moment when I could touch that building and change people's lives and save energy. Yeah. And this is something that I need you to understand because this is what keeps you going. Because if you go to work every day just changing pipes, you know, screwing things on, screwing things off, you're gonna go nuts. You're going to get frustrated, you're going to, you're going to leave the industry, but if you can see the beauty of this and the history of it and realize that you are a piece of something that is big and important and vital, you know, 
got time for a, a, a quick story? Please. I, I, I read. I, I don't, you know, I don't do much other than read. I mean, that's, that's what I do. But, but, and I read lists. I read, you know, I, I get into my head. I want to read everything that was written about this. So a couple of years ago, I said, I want to read every book that won the Pulitzer Prize for, for fiction. And, they, and it started in, in 1911, and, and it, you know, it was up to today. So, and I said, I'm going to read them from the ends. I'm going to read the, this, the first book and, and the current book, and I'm, then I'm going to read the next two, and I'm going to read the next two. And while I'm doing this, because the Pulitzer Prize has to be a, written by an American, and it has to be about American life. So in doing this, I'm going to find out some, some things about the way people lived. So I'm reading these books from the, from the outside in, and in the earlier books, they are talking about the heating... Uh, they, they're talking about winter like it's a character. This is something that existed inside as well as outside. This is something that was going to come into your house and kill your children, and you had to protect against it. We don't even think about stuff like this anymore. Right. We, th we think this is normal for this building to be 70 degrees on a day like this. This is not normal. This does not happen on its own. This is what we make happen. So in the earlier Pulitzer books, they are marveling at these things, and they get everything technically right. They, they're, they're talking about building a fire. They're talking about making a boiler work in New York. They're talking about the, the magician that comes in here and is able to do this un, incredible thing called making it warm inside. The books on the other end, oh, they're about angst and depression and <laughs> sex and anxiety. And if they get anything right about it, uh, if they write about the heating, it's, it's a butt crack joke about the plumber, or, or, it's, or, or they get it technically wrong, which makes me crazy, because isn't there anybody in the book business that's checking these authors? They're talking about pumping the steam. I want to strangle the guy. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading these, and, and I'm watching as we approach the middle, 1964, in the middle of the list. And, and somewhere along the line, we began to do what we do so well that we became invisible. Right? When you look at the hammer and you talk about it, nothing happens until somebody picks up that tool. This is what you need to get. You need to realize that you are doing something that is essential to human life, essential to the life of this city. Hey, baby, I hear the blues and are calling, toss salads and scrambled eggs. So Mercy. You, I was born to walk and maybe I door. seem a bit confused. Yeah, maybe, but I got you pegs. But I don't know what to do with those tossed salads and scrambled eggs. And I gave them. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They're calling again. Hey, so much. Scrambled eggs all over my face. What is a boy to do? 